Alrighty, crew. Just let me make sure that everything is looking good. <clears throat> I think so far so good. Guys, good morning. Um, welcome to week 10, the lucky last module. How fast time flies. So guys, what the, the game plan for today is, is that we're going to... Um, we're going to be soldiering on on our game plan for uh, finishing off uh, Anatomy and Physiology 2 uh, by bringing it back to really where it all begins. And this is looking at um, reproduction and development. Um, so again, I'm going to try and keep an eye on the chat there. Um, please shout out if I'm going too fast or if there's an issue with audio. We don't have chainsaws today, <laughs> but we do have plumbers. <laughs> Um, so hopefully it won't be too bad. Um, I'm using some cool new software uh, to uh, sort of mitigate and get rid of background noise. Um, so hopefully we should be good. But just again, if there are, I'm looking at the waveform of the audio. It looks okay right now, but uh, yeah, if it does change, just just hit me up. Just let me know. So guys, without without further ado, let us begin. Oh, I don't even have my laser pointer. There we go. There we go. Okay. So what are we doing today, guys? What's what's the what's the game plan? Not that button. That's not the game plan. <laughs> okay. So what we're going to be doing is essentially um, looking at the male and female uh, reproductive systems. Okay. Look at the bits and bobs there, and uh, sort of be able to explain what it is that they do. Now, <clears throat> looking at the basic events within gametogenesis. Uh, look, I'm, I'm really not going to spend much slash any time on, um, and, and the predominant reason for that guys is that, uh, I, I, I feel it's going to be getting a little bit too intricate when we, if we really sort of delve into sort of the, the, the genetics, the like sort of more Mendelian genetics, um, that we see with gametogenesis. Um, I just don't think it's overly necessary. I will touch on it very briefly, uh, but I'm not going to go into it in any, um, extrinsic detail. Uh, we will be looking at the ovarian and uh, uterine cycles. Okay, and we're looking at sort of the various hormonal controls. Again, so we're gonna try and keep it nice and nice and short and sweet, nice and brief. Um, we're going to be looking at what testosterone, what estrogen, and what progesterone does. We're gonna look what fertilization means um, and what happens there in terms of the um, implantation of the blastocyst. But again, gonna keep it nice and simple. Um, and then we'll wrap up with a little bit of embryonic and fetal development. <clears throat> and of course, like after, you know, implantation, fertilization, all that, and like um, we're going to discuss pregnancy and some of the um, physiological changes that we see there. So, Looking at the reproductive system, uh, where am I? Here I am. Okay, so looking at the reproductive system, we've got some primary sex organs. These uh, are often uh, not misunderstood, but a lot of people don't. They, they, they yeah, well, yeah, it is misunderstood. <laughs> it's basically it. Um, so, guys, the, the primary sex organs for males and females are the testes and the ovaries, respectively. Uh, it is not the penis and the vagina. Okay, that is not the primary sex organs. Okay, because the the purpose of our primary sex organs are to produce our gametes. Now, gametes are quite unique in terms of the, that type of cell. Uh, interestingly, it's both the largest and the smallest cell that we have, um, uh, but <clears throat> it's also the, the chromosomal makeup that is very different. But again, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. And, and of course, a big function too of our primary sex organs is not only the production of our um, reproductive cells or our sex cells, it is also the production of our sex hormones, okay? These steroidal sex hormones, things like, you know, testosterone and estrogen, progesterone and stuff like that. Now, these sex hormones play a rather large role within um, our body in terms of development and um uh, and, and reproduction, especially. Um, and they drive, you know, sexual behavior, it drives puberty, maturation, stuff like that, and growth and development. Um, this is a big reason why, you know, males and females are different in terms of our physical structure. Um, at the moment, I've got a bit of a 5 p.m. shadow going on. Um, that is due primarily to testosterone. 
Um, now, well, these are our primary sex, uh, sex organs. Uh, we do also have accessory reproductive organs, dark glands, all that sort of stuff, which we're going to talk about in a moment. So we're going to be looking at, um, uh, at, at reproduction and development here. We're going to be looking at it from sort of two perspectives, like sort of two angles here. Uh, the first one will be hormonal. So we're going to be looking at the various hormone body body chemicals here. Uh, sorry, let me move myself over here. Uh, various body signals and body chemicals there to, um, uh, you know, that helps control these systems. And the second thing will be um, sort of more anatomical and looking at these physical structures. So the first thing I want to look at here, uh, this is called a negative feedback loop, which is something I'm going to explain a little bit further in a moment. But what we see here is our um, pituitary gland and what's uh, sorry the hypothalamus rather um, now what we see here is the production of a hormone called GnRH so we will need to know uh, I'm going to be speaking I think about five yeah there are five different hormones here I'm going to be discussing uh, we will definitely need to uh, to know all of those and the first one of those five is gonadotropin releasing hormone. Uh, pardon me, guys. Uh, there's a bit of a cold snap and it's uh, just giving me a bit of a dry cough. Um, so what's going to happen here is that beginning around age eight, now there are a lot of different factors that can obviously change and alter this, uh, but this is essentially the, be the beginning of um, puberty. And what's going to happen is, is that uh, within the hypothalamus, it's going to stimulate the release of a hormone called gonadotropin releasing hormone. Now, this hormone kind of, it, it kind of kickstarts everything downstream. It kind of starts this whole process off. And what this is going to do is it's going to trigger the pituitary gland to release two hormones. This is luteinizing hormone, LH, and follicle stimulating hormone, FSH. Now, this is the same in both males and females. But what is also very important to note is that how that, uh, or the, both those hormones, luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone, how they interact or what they interact with makes a big difference in terms of the overall effect. So for instance, with luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone in the testes, okay, what that will then do is it will trigger the release of testosterone. Whereas in females, it's going to, um, you know, go to the ovary and it's going to trigger the release of estrogen. Now, what we see here, uh, just because males, okay, we have testes, um, therefore I'm going to release testosterone. And that does not mean that I only produce testosterone and I produce zero estrogen, okay? I do produce a small amount of estrogen and vice versa. Females will also produce a small amount of testosterone, okay? These aren't exclusive to one or the other. Now, if we're looking at this graph, oh, not graph, this, this schematic, I guess you would say, um, what we see here is that testosterone is released and it's resulting in you know, the, these various effects. Um, so we've got spermatogenesis. So <clears throat> what is spermatogenesis? So spermato meaning sort of spermazoa. These are sperm cells. Um, this is the gamut for males. And this is a primary contributor to the male uh, secondary sexual characteristics. So this is essentially what we, the, the, the sexual characteristics that uh, occur in males uh, during Puberty. These are things like, you know, um, penile growth. These are things like um, increased production of body hair in terms of thickness uh, and, and sort of density. Things like, you know, the growth of facial hair and stuff like that. Um, the elongation of the larynx. Okay. Basically the, the, the voice dropping. Um, things like increased muscle production. Things like broadening of the chest, broadening of the shoulders. These kinds of things. Okay. These are... Uh, this is what testosterone does. Now, for females, we see uh, a similar kind of development here, but what we see is um, folliculogenesis. Now, this is the... Um, now, females don't produce um, 
oocytes or eggs, okay, uh, from birth. That's the same amount that all females are going to have. But what we see is the maturation of these um, follicles, which we're going to talk about um, in a moment. And this is the development of that uh, and maturation of that um, ovum before it's released from the um, from the ovary. Now, what we see here with female sexual characteristics are also, um, you know, undergoing with the release of estrogen, things like, you know, um, breast development, um, broadening of the hips, broadening um, of the sort of shoulders and that sort of area. Not so much shoulders, but yeah, definitely that the sort of hip to get ready for childbirth. Um, uh, the, the um, you know, to begin menstruating, these sorts of things. Um, now with both of these cycles, what you'll notice is, is that we've got, you know, obviously leading to these secondary characteristics down here, but leading up here, we also have a negative sign. What this is essentially telling us is this is our negative feedback loop. What this means is, is that if we have the release of testosterone, what that is going to do is the presence of testosterone is going to inhibit gonadotropin releasing hormone, okay? And this is a very good way that our body can control um, the amount of either testosterone or uh, estrogen, excuse me, that is being uh, secreted. So, for instance, if we suddenly, uh, I need to stop saying we, okay? Uh, if I, let's say, have a surge of testosterone right now, okay? Um, just the teaching online is just giving me a, a surge of tes testosterone right now. Um, what that is going to do is because I'm going to have an increased concentration of testosterone in my body, that is then going to inhibit the release of gonadotropin releasing hormone, which is going to reduce the amount of luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone that's being released. Sorry, I should zoom in just a little bit. There we go. And by reducing the amount of LH and FSH that's being released, that's going, going, eh, that's going to uh, decrease the amount of testosterone that's being produced. Now, let's say I, I you know, the, the hype of teaching online sort of tapers off and... Uh, I'm no longer have such a huge amount of testosterone um, sur like coursing my veins, then what's going to happen is this inhibitory pathway is not going to be active, which means gonadotropin releasing hormone will be released as per normal and away we go. So this is a good way that our bodies can monitor uh, the, the how much testosterone we have or, or estrogen. And then if our levels sort of drop a bit, we can then release more gonadotropin releasing hormone. Um, so what would I expect you guys to know, say, from this slide here in particularly? I would expect you to know uh, these four, uh, sorry, five hormones, uh, gonadotropin releasing hormone, luteinizing hormone, follicle stimulating hormone, testosterone, and estrogen. Be aware that test uh, testosterone and estrogen work as a negative feedback loop for gonadotropin releasing hormone. And also just be aware of some of the um, sexual characteristics that are... Um, I don't want to say induced. That seems like the wrong word. That are that, that are that are established or that are caused by the release of these hormones. Okay, now uh, a, a typical with any kind of uh, new organ system that we discuss. Um, we obviously need to have a look at some of the major structures here. So, looking at the male reproductive system, a um, couple of things that we need to be aware of. Um, the first one here is, uh, we'll start from the testes and we'll work our way around. So here we have the testes that are um, enclosed within the scrotal sac. Now the, the scrotum, okay, this is the sac that, can, that contains and holds the testes. Now the testes also have this um, top structure here and this is called the epididymis. Um, <laughs> uh, probably inappropriate of me to say this, but um, a great way to think about this is the nut mullet, okay? It, it kind of looks like an 80s mullet. Uh, and if you don't know what a mullet is, uh, Google it, okay? It is, it is a wondrous hairstyle that has since uh, uh, lost its glory, I guess, and has since died out. <laughs> um, <laughs> 
goodness, excuse me. Um, so th- that's a good way to sort of remember the epididymis. The epididymis is the mullet of the testy. <laughs> and, and what's going to happen is that that's going to then connect to this sort of tubing that we can see up here. And the, uh, this is our vas deferens, okay? The vas deferens. So what we see in the testes is, um, you know, sperm production. Then that those sperm uh, cells are going to move into the epididymis where they're going to be, um, they're going to sort of mature and, and grow up, I guess. And then what's going to happen is that they're going to move up our vas deferens across here, and it's going to enter what is called the ampulla. Now, the ampulla is kind of like the, uh, a slight widening um, of the of the vas deferens there. Uh, yeah, that's okay. Uh, actually, here's probably better. Now, as we move around here, we, we are moving around this sort of large structure in the center here. This is the bladder, okay? This is the urinary bladder. So, what we can see here, which has actually been cut uh, in this image, which I'll just zoom in a little bit. There we go. That is the ureter. So coming back to what we were doing yesterday, uh, yesterday, last week, rather, when we were looking at the kidneys and we were looking at urine production, blah, 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 that is connecting to here. Now, as we move, uh, uh through our vas deferens, we've then entered this sort of widening area here. This is the ampulla. We notice we then, there's sort of a bit of a, 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 a junction, here. Now, what we have here that's connected um, to this junction and is sitting next to the ampulla, this is the seminal gland. And what this does is it produces seminal fluid. Now, I'm going to be talking about seminal fluid and sperm maturation and development and all that sort of stuff um, in a moment. Now, what's going to then happen is that the ampulla of the vas deferens, uh, keeping in mind too, it, it can also be called ductus deferens. Um, I personally refer to it as vas deferens. Um, however, again, if you want to call it ductus deferens or, um, yeah, so ductus deferens, that's fine. I just ask that you be consistent. Um, and what we see here is that they will then connect. Uh, so two will sort of merge into one pipe here. And this is uh, within the prostate, okay? This sort of muscle um, that is surrounding these pipes, we're sort of moving straight through the prostate. And then upon um, contraction of the prostate, sort of um, during male orgasm, what you're going to then see is it's going to work as a pump and it's going to then push the combination of our um, sperm and uh, semen here, um, uh, through the urethra, okay, and out to the exterior. Now, the the uh, squared off areas, they're the, they're the main things I would expect you to know, be able to label um, at a minimum. Uh, probably one... Actually, no, that, that's pretty much everything that, that, that I would expect you guys to sort of have memorized. The only thing I, I would probably add to that would be the ejaculatory duct. That would be the only additional thing I would, I would add on to this. Okay, so this is what I was essentially sort of talking about and explaining uh, just before I might do, whoopsies, there we go. Now we have the, the testes, and these are the primary sex organs, as I said before. Um, now, what the primary purpose here that we have with the male reproductive system is the production and delivery of semen. Now, what we need to be very aware of here, guys, is the difference between sperm and semen, because they are not the same thing. Actually, I'll just go down here, okay? Sperm and semen are not the same thing. What sperm refers to is spermatozoa, okay? These are the sperm cells themselves. Seminal fluid is the sort of alkaline fluid that surrounds those sperm cells. And it, you know, um, helps to um, neutralize some of the uh, acidity that is found in the vagina. It also contains things like glucose to help, you know, uh, keep the sperm um, alive. And that is what's happening here. Okay, this combination, because the sperm cells themselves are sort of uh, growing up and being developed in the epididymis. They then move up the vas deferens and will then, um, upon um, 
uh, ejaculation, what you see is a, a combination of the sperm cells, which is from here. Sorry, I should zoom in a bit. Uh, a combination of the sperm cells and the semen, okay? The seminal fluid here. Now, the scrotum, okay? The scrotum is a, 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 it's essentially a sac, okay? It's a sac of loose skin and connective tissue and smooth muscle there. And it is divided into two separate pouches that hold both, both you know, the left and the right um, testy. Now, the smooth muscle, that is located within the scrotum, which I'm going to talk about in a moment. That is the datus muscle. Okay, there are uh, th two different muscles and um, one sort of vascular network I'm going to talk about at a moment. Um, because what is incredibly important for uh, temperature regulation, especially when it comes to the testes and when it comes to sperm um, production, is that the testes must be approximately two to three degrees lower than core body temperature. Now, this makes things a little bit uh, tricky because uh, the, the, the scrotum and, and sperm production is sensitive to, to temperature. Um, and this is a, a large reason as, uh, for, for infidelity uh, amongst a lot of males. So what we, what we see here is that the body needs to try and keep the temperature three degrees approximately uh, lower than core body temperature. Okay, how does the body do this? Well, there's, there's a couple of different things that we can do here. Uh, let us say that the testes are too hot, okay? The temperature is too warm and we need to try to cool them down. There is a couple of things that will happen. One, within the scrotum, okay? So within the scrotum, we have, sorry, let me, yeah, we go, there we go. Uh, within the scrotum, we have the datus muscle, which is what I mentioned before. Now, what the datus muscle will do in the event that the testes are too hot is that the datus muscle will relax. And what, the, the, what that will do is it will relax and increase the surface area of, um, of the scrotum. And by increasing that surface area, it's increasing the amount of heat that can uh, be removed um, from the testes, from the scrotum there, therefore decreasing that overall temperature. The next muscle I want to talk about is the cremaster muscle. Okay. The cremaster muscle, um, is again, a, a series of smooth muscle that we see, um, around, uh, the testes in, inside the, the scrotal sac. And again, in the event that we, uh, the testes are too hot, what is going to happen is that the cremaster muscle is going to relax and the testes are going to descend. They are going to drop further down away from the body. Again, in an attempt to try and sort of separate itself from the body um, to try and uh, release heat. Now, in the event that the testes are too cold, okay, we need to warm them up. What we are going to see is effectively the opposite, okay? The cremaster muscle here is going to constrict. And what that will do is that it will pull the testes up and closer to the body um, to basically retain that heat. And the same with the datus muscle down here, um, that is going to constrict. And what that is going to do is, is, is sort of pull them closer in. It's going to reduce that surface area and it's going to um, sort of try and, uh, and hold in that heat. Now, those were the two um, muscles here, but there's one other complex I haven't spoken about. And that is this pampiniform venous plexus. Now, what is happening here with this pampiniform venous plexus is we have arterial blood that is coming down and feeding the testes, okay? It's obviously very important. It needs a blood supply. If it doesn't have a blood supply, it's not going to last too long. So, that's all well and good, but the the blood that's coming in, that arterial blood, is coming from the body's core. It's hot, okay? It's, it is very, very warm. So, if the testes are very hot, you know, we're trying to keep them at around three degrees colder than core body temperature. So, how, how, how do we sort of achieve this? Well, one way the body does it is via this pamponiform venous plexus. It is wrapping itself and surrounding around the, the artery there. Okay, surrounding around this testicular artery because the, the venous blood is 
obviously a lot cooler than the the arterial blood, especially when we take into account that, you know, the cremaster muscle, the datus muscle that's helping to um, remove a lot of that heat. So what's going to happen is as this venous blood is moving away from the testes, when, you know, the temperature regulation is no longer as important, what it's going to do is actually by surrounding this testicular artery, it's helping to remove and cool down the, the testicular artery, that the blood within the testicular artery before it reaches the testes. Okay, so it's, it's trying to leach heat out and away from the testicular artery before it reaches the testes. So I would expect you guys to know these three things, especially, okay? I would expect you to know the pempiniform venous plexus, the cremaster muscle, and the datus muscle. And I would also expect you to be able to understand how they help to control um, or thermoregulate uh, the testes. Okay, so now what we're going to do is essentially look and zoom into the testes in a little bit more detail, okay? Now, within the testes, we have several hundred um, compartments that are referred to as lobules. Now, within each lobule, what we see is around two or three seminiferous tubules, now, this is important because what these seminiferous tubules do is they produce sperm, okay? They undergo spermatogenesis. Now, ah, here we go. This is a better diagram. So, what we can see here is that we can see our blood supply there, our sort of testicular artery coming down here. We've got our testes, our lobules. Within the lobule, we can see these um, seminiferous tubules. And this is essentially where the... the um, sperm cells are, are being are being produced. Now, what we can also see down here is um, these seminiferous tubules are connected to the top or, or you know, or sort of this head area here of the epididymis. And this is what I was talking about before with that sperm maturation. And once it's sort of matured, it will then move down, move up. And now we're, we can see this is now connecting to the vas deferens. Okay, now um, I'm not going to I'm not going to talk too much about the histology um, of the of the testes, but there are two tissue types. I keep doing that. <laughs> there are two different tissue types. I do expect you to know within the testes. These are the Sertoli cells and the Leydig cells. So, wh what are these cells? What do they do? Okay, now the Sertoli cells. Now, keep in mind, they are also called um, sustenacular cells. Uh, I personally, again, I call them um, Sertoli cells. Um, what they will essentially do is they act kind of like the nannies, okay? What they do is they help to um, provide nutrients, they prov provide fluid, they, they help to control um, the, the release of these sperm cells. They basically look after them uh, while, while they're being developed essentially. Uh, and, and that's what we can sort of see down here. We've got these um, sperm cells that are being produced and we have these Sertoli cells that are sort of producing um, nutrients and, and sort of reinforcing and supporting that, that surrounding area. Now, what we also have are Leydig cells. Now, what Leydig cells, these exist outside of the tubules and they are responsible for secreting testosterone. So, if I rewind a little bit, and come back to here, okay, within the testes, okay, this LH and FSH, okay, going to the testes, and what that is going to do is it's going to uh, stimulate those Leydig cells to produce and release testosterone. Okay, now again, I'm not going to go too in, in depth and too intricate within um, spermatogenesis here, but what we need to be aware of um, is that the there are two types of cells that we have in the human body that are referred to as haploid. And what this essentially means is that hey, they have one copy of a chromosome, not two. Now, this is important because there are only two different cells that have that, um, as opposed to every single other somatic cell type, which is diploid, okay? They have 46 chromosomes. Now, why is it that the sex cells only have half? Why is it that they only have uh, 23 instead of 46? 
because when sperm and egg uh, combine during fertilization, what's going to happen is that the genetic material from sperm and the genetic material from egg are going to fuse and combine. So half of mum, half of dad make all of you. And that is where we see um, uh, that new sort of diploid cell. So I, the big thing here when we're looking at the um, sperm cell and the uh, oocyte, the egg cell, is that they have um, 23 chromosomes because they need to fuse together. So what you're seeing, you, you know, you, you're probably seeing this a lot in this diagram and um, sort of said uh, before in, in this diagram over here is looking at N. It says N and then 2N. What is that referring to? Okay. N is just essentially looking at the number of chromosomes. So if we have our sort of um, quote normal cells or our somatic cells, these are referred to as 2N because they have two copies of every chromosome, which that's good. Now, with our sperm cells, these are referred to as N because they have one of each chromosome. Okay, so that's all that's referring to there. And, that, and that's about as far as we are going to take this uh, in, in terms of uh, sort of the, the more genetic uh, component. Like, you know, I'm not sort of going to go into the cell cycle and meiosis one and meiosis two. I'm not going to worry about that. However, it is very interesting if you want to look up some more genetic stuff. Okay, now what we're seeing and looking at here, this this sort of uh, more uh, clip art friendly, let us call it, <laughs> uh, a diagram here is essentially the exact same thing that was being described here. Okay, there's just a little bit more detail on on this slide. So what we are looking at here um, is the hypothalamus is going to release gonadotropin releasing um, hormone. What that is going to do is it's going to then trigger trigger the release of luteinizing hormone and uh, follicle stimulating hormone. Now these two hormones are then going to go into the bloodstream and they're going to stimulate um, two various pathways. The first one, our luteinizing hormone, is going to bind to and trigger our Leydig cells to secrete and release testosterone. And our FSH, our follicle stimulating hormone, is going to then trigger spermatogenesis to produce more sperm cells. Excuse me. Now, I've also mentioned this negative control here. So the presence of testosterone is going to deactivate this pathway. And uh, just a bit of an interesting sort of side note here. This is why people who abuse anabolic steroids. So uh, people who try to sort of do um, sort of muscle building and stuff like that by um, sort of abusing steroids. One of the um, side effects of that is it can cause um, testicular atrophy or basically a, a shrinking of the testes. And, and what is essentially happening here is this pathway, this uh, this negative feedback loop is being triggered. So what is happening is that if we have, say, a... Um, a bodybuilder like that who is um, injecting themselves with anabolic steroids to try and increase um, muscle production. The problem with that is that, sure, it will do that, okay? Testosterone will increase that muscle production, sure. But this testosterone, as we can see over here, is going to then inhibit our gonadotropin-releasing hormone, luteinizing hormone, and follicle-stimulating hormone. This means that because this is inhibited due to the presence of testosterone, there's not uh, there's going to be a significant decrease in the amount of signals being sent to the testes, to the Leydig cells, and uh, you know to our our tubules there to produce um, sperm cells and to produce testosterone. Now, this is a problem because, uh, as I'm sure you guys have heard the saying, if you don't use it, you lose it. So, because they are injecting testosterone and they are getting it from a, an artificial source, the testes aren't having to produce as much testosterone, which means that the tissue will begin to sort of degrade, which is why in, in people who do abuse anabolic steroids, um, a common thing that is observed is um, testicular atrophy.
Okay, the epididymis. So the epididymis lines sort of the top of the, the testy and will sort of wrap around um, the posterior side and then go down to the the bottom of the of the testy there. And what it will do it will, is it will collect um, all of the sperm cells that have been um, produced from the seminiferous tubules. Uh, and a really good diagram of that is what we were looking at over here. So we can see the seminiferous tubules within the lobules of the testy. And what that is then going to do is they are going to then move up into the epididymis here, um, which will then eventually loop around behind the testy and then connect up to the, the, um, the vas deferens. Now, what is essentially happening here within the epididymis is, is a couple of different things. One, it is uh, where the sperm cells um, is being uh, matured and sort of developed further to increase that motility, especially. Um, it, it, sperm can also be stored there for approximately one to two months, again, um, varying on... Um, sperm release, let's just say that, um, and also is responsible for moving and propelling st uh, uh, the, these sperm cells into the, the um, vas deferens there to be, to be moved up via that contraction of smooth muscle. So the big takeaway message here from the, the epididymis is uh, if, if, we, if we think of our Sertoli cells as being like, uh, like the nanny, Right, that's it's it's sort of looking after our baby sperm cells, making sure they're well fed, they're looked after, all that sort of stuff. You can kind of think of the epididymis as like um, uh, almost like the high school teacher. Okay, um, it, it kind of babysits, looks after them. Okay, make sure they're matured and grown up, and they have the skills they need to get the job done <laughs> as successful sperm cells. I am so sorry to any high school teachers out there. <laughs> okay, so our brand new little spermies—they um, have been born, they have been created, they have then been matured um, and and raised into the strong, polite little swimmers that they are within the epididymis. What is then going to happen there? Okay, it's going to then move up our vas deferens here. Now, what it's then going to do is going to move up and wrap around and sort of the very last portion is this ampulla. It's this slight widening section here. Now, um, these, these sperm cells can be stored in the ampulla. They can be viable there for, for several months at a time, of course, all, um, varying. Um, now two other, um, pieces of tissue here I do want to discuss are the, um, uh, corpora ca um, cavernosa and the corp um, corpus, uh, spongiosum. So, what we're seeing here is this, um, this corpora cavernosa is um, a sort of a very vascularized um, network, this sort of spongy tissue. And what that does is that will um, a sort of during an erection, it will engorge with blood and it will, um, you know, this is cause sort of the, the hardening and expansion in size. However, what we see here is a bit of a problem. What we're looking at here is essentially a pipe. Now, if we increase the amount of blood flow and subsequently the pressure within here, the one thing that we absolutely don't want, and it's like what we were talking about with the uh, trachea and, and primary bronchioles in the lungs, we don't want to have an increase in pressure here and just cause that, I was just about to say airway, that is not an airway, uh, to collapse. We don't want it to, under pressure, to just, you know, shut. That's bad. Uh, it kind of defeats the purpose. What we instead have is this corpus spongiosum here. And what this is, is that this will also um, engorge with blood and will kind of firm up and will uh, make the, uh, will make the sort of urethra more rigid. So it ensures that during an erection that the urethra doesn't um, sort of uh, collapse. It doesn't sort of, um, sort of shunt and, and block itself, if that makes sense. Okay, now, um, what we're looking
looking at here is a, is a posterior view of the ejaculatory ducts. Now, these ejaculatory ducts, I, I, probably is actually easier to look at it on this angle, is the, uh, the point in which our ampulla and the seminal gland will fuse and join together as, um, as one here, this sort of fusion point down here. Now, um, I've pretty much already discussed that with the urethra and looking um, at our various spongy tissue there. Now, in our ejaculatory duct over here that we were looking at, the most important thing that is happening here is the fusion or combination of the ampulla and the seminal fluid. And the purpose for that is essentially during ejaculation, uh, let me do that. There we go. Um, during ejaculation, uh, essentially what happens at the very last minute, uh, you know, at the point of climax, what is going to happen is that the sperm cells and the seminal fluid are both going to be released. Okay. So the um, seminal fluid um, from those that, that um, uh, seminal gland and those sperm cells from the ampulla are going to then mix and be combined and then will be propelled via a rhythmic uh, constriction of the uh, prostate gland for um, ejaculation. Now, what's important too to take note is that your the, the male body does not just shoot raw sperm cells. It's not like a machine gun <laughs> of sorts, okay? Um, it must be combined with this seminal fluid because, um, you know, it can take several days sometimes for, um, those, those sperm cells to, you know, carry out that treacherous journey of fertilization. So what's going to happen is it's going to be slightly alkaline. This is to help combat the, the slight acidity, um, that is seen within the vagina. Um, it is also very sticky due to the contents of, of glucose and nutrients that are required to obviously power, um, those sperm cells for, um, yeah, for fertilization. Okay, now the actual penis itself here, um, this is the the two um, sort of spongy tissue types I was explaining uh, before, this corpora cavernosa, um, which this is what uh, facilitates the erection by, you know, holding um, a, a, a far more blood than uh, during its, its sort of... Um, more flaccid state. Uh, and then we've got the, the corpus spongiosum, and this prevents the comp uh, compression and, and sort of clamping of the urethra um, during an erection. So again, just a, a very quick recap. What we can see here is my mouse not working. Um, is the testes here where we have um, the, the production of those sperm cells. They then move into the epididymis in which we have the maturation and temporary storage of sperm cells. They will then move up the vas deferens and are down here to the ampulla. Now, next to the ampulla, now we have two different ampullas because we have two testes. Now, as we move up this ampulla, we then have our seminal gland that's directly next to it during ejaculation. What's going to happen is the release of the sperm within the ampulla and the semen within, or the, sorry, uh, the release of the sperm and the seminal fluid, I should say, um, will then move down uh, through this ejaculatory duct into the prostate where it will be mixed so this is where we now have semen and then the prostate, like a, a, a sort of a big pump will then contract and squeeze and will push that semen through the urethra and out to the exterior. Now, one other thing I will mention as well is, um, when uh, males feel as though, look, I've had enough kids, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to call it quits, then uh, you can have a, a procedure called a vasectomy. And what a vasectomy is, um, is the, the, the cutting of the vas deferens. So what will happen is that the sperm will be produced, it will then be developed in the epididymis, but then as it moves up 
the the sort of the plumbing, as it were, the vas deferens here, if they have been cut, so if the, this male has received a uh, a vasectomy, what will then happen is that those sperm cells will simply leak. Um, out here. They will not be moved up um, across the um, vas deferens and they won't enter this area because the, the piping has been cut. Um, now, even if a male does have a vasectomy, they will still produce ejaculate, but it will just be entirely seminal fluid. There'll be no sperm. But what's also important to note is that um, you know, if you do have a vasectomy, what they will essentially tell you is... Um, you must still wear protection for at least 15 to, to 20 um, ejaculations. And that is because of those sperm cells that are stored within the ampulla or may still be present um, within the, the so say, the, the top part of the vas deferens here. Um, it, it has happened where people have had a vasectomy, thought, cool, okay, um, this is no longer a problem anymore. They have then not used any protection and due, even though they've had the procedure and the, pre, uh, the procedure was successful, um, they still had sperm cells present uh, in this top part and within the ampulla here. Um, so that's why, um, you know, fertility clinics and that after you do have a vasectomy, they will um, ask you to come in after a certain amount of time or a certain number of releases and they will ask, uh, essentially get you to uh, deliver a, a sperm sample and they will do a sperm count. Um, this is also how they do check for, um, you know, sterility. Uh, they, they will look at for things like, um, you know, concentration. How many sperm cells are there in a particular sample? So, uh, in the case of someone who's had a vasectomy uh, and they've come back after a few weeks or a few months, you would hope that would be very, very close to zero, or actually zero. Um, but they also do look at, you know, people who say uh, they're trying to fall. Oh, my voice is buffering. Uh-oh, okay, Ho hopefully that's better. Oh, this is still buffering. Is, is it still buffering now, guys, or has it sort of fixed itself? Better now? Okay, Whew. thanks guys, thanks for letting me know. Um, what was I saying? Oh, that's right. Yes, yes. Um, so if say, uh, you know, a, a couple are trying to fall pregnant and they're sort of having difficulty do, doing so, they will do a, um, you know, a, a, a sperm count. They'll do a, a sperm uh, analysis or a semen analysis and they'll look for things like, you know, sperm concentration. Uh, they will also look for things like motility. Um, it's all well and good to have plenty of sperm, but if they aren't moving as effectively or as, say, as as vigorously as what they should be, that's obviously going to have a very large effect when it comes to, um, uh, 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 when, when, it, when it comes to sort of, uh, fertilization. Okay. So, um, obviously to even kickstart this whole process of fertilization and, and pregnancy and all that sort of stuff, um, the male must be able to achieve an erection, okay? This is obviously an increase in um, in blood flow, okay? This dilation of the penile arteries, okay? Increasing that blood flow into the corpora cavernosa, um, which is going to um, increase sort of that, the size and firmness that you see with an erection, um, a, a, allowing and facilitating the, the delivery of, um, of, of semen. Now, there are several drugs that can, that can help uh, for some males who say have a, 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 you know erectile dysfunction and stuff like that, um, Viagra or Cialis, okay, they help to reduce the breakdown of CGMP, so cyclic guanosine monophosphate, and what this um, enzyme does, okay, is um, it, it it causes vasodilation and it will increase blood flow. So by reducing its breakdown, it means there is more CGMP um, present, which will cause an increase in that vasodilation and blood flow, which will help facilitate um, uh, uh, erections. Okay, so um, ejaculation, okay, it is controlled by a sympathetic reflex. And what's then going to happen is um, rhythmic peristaltic const uh, contractions within the vas deferens. So this is to help move those sperm cells up into that ampulla there. Um, 
for a combination in the uh, ejaculatory ducts with the seminal fluid. Now, the uh, urinary bladder sphincter will close. So this is an important thing here with males especially. Um, we sort of have a one, we only have one pipe, okay? We've only got one piece of plumbing that kind of does everything. Now, what's also important is that during ejaculation, especially, um, a, cu a couple of things here. <laughs> one, um, as we were talking about with the blood and with heart, this is a one-way one -way road, okay? So, during ejaculation, we want that ejaculate to go this way. We do not, and I repeat, we do not want it to go this way. We do not want any of that ejaculate to move into the bladder. Now, vice versa. Obviously, this is a lot of um, rhythmic contraction and there can be a lot of force in this area. So, another thing you don't want is urine to come out, okay? Um, especially during ejaculation, you do not want a sort of semen and urine to all come out at the same time. That's obviously very bad. It is one hell of a mood killer. <laughs> so, what happens here is that the sphincter between uh, the urinary bladder and the urethra here will actually close to uh, basically prevent expulsion of urine um, during uh, ejaculation or, or during um, a, a, an erection. Now, um, post ejaculatory period, what you see here is a refractory period. Now we've spoken about refractory periods before when we were looking at um, action potentials and, and uh, when we were looking at the conduction system of the heart. Um, obviously the, the refractory period here is um, a little bit uh, different. Now, what this is explaining from a um, reproduction perspective is uh, the refractory period is a period of time in which it is um, impossible for a male to achieve uh, or, or maintain another um, erection and be able to um, undergo ejaculation again. Now, interestingly, the re uh, refractory period is actually... Um, uh, highly varied between um, males, and it's actually a current area of uh, of research, um, as there is such a huge um, uh, discrepancy there. There's there's a huge uh, variance between the refractory periods of various males, in which some have reported um, several minutes. The the most common um, refractory period is sort of several hours. Um, however, there have been uh, many cases of um, zero refractory period, and there have also been cases of people who um, their refractory period is several days to weeks. So um, yeah, it is, it is widely varied and, and um, is, is a current area of research. Okay, guys, that was a lot of information that we just, um, that we sort of sped through. Um, something that I'm hoping to sort of point out to you guys is that as we move through to the female reproductive system, which uh, is just a bit more uh, more complicated than, uh, than us poor, simple males, um, there is a lot of similarity there, okay? There is a, a lot of overlap. So what we'll do, guys, let's take a quick, uh, let's take a 10 minute break, stand up, stretch your legs, grab a cup of coffee. And what we will do is um, after 10 minute break, Either, we will then move on to looking at the female reproductive system. Alrighty, crew. Let us resume. Let us resume our journey of the male and female reproductive systems. So, we've spent some time now um, discussing the male reproductive system, which, in my personal opinion, is is a lot simpler. Um, however, whoops. Uh oh, let me do that. There we go. Let us now discuss the female reproductive system. 
So a couple of things here that we do need to be aware of. Um, the first one, the primary uh, reproductive organ here is the ovaries here that produce those oocytes, um, but they also uh, produce um, important hormones like estrogen and, and progesterone. Um, these are connected via these fallopian tubes. Okay, these are also uh, called uterine tubes. Um, again, I, I, I refer to them as fallopian tubes, uh, which then connect to, uh, to the uterus here. Uh, the uterus is separated from the vagina via uh, the, the cervix and the vagina obviously leads down to, um, to the exterior. Now, already uh, we can start to see quite a few similarities, okay? Like two ovaries, two testes that are connected via, instead of um, vas deferens, they're connected by fallopian tubes, okay? There are a lot of sort of very subtle um, similarities here in terms of the male and the female reproductive system. Um, now, the main things that we need to be aware of here in uh, it, it, with respect to uh, knowing the main uh, sort of uh, physical structures of the female uh, primary and secondary reproductive system. We obviously need to be aware of the ovaries here. Uh, we're, we're going to talk a lot more about the, the specifics within the ovary. Um, we also have these fimbrae here. These are sort of... Uh, not hair-like, they're kind of like finger-like uh, structures. And what they do is they help to sort of scoop and, and sort of uh, pull the, the released uh, egg. So we can, let me zoom in a little bit. There we go. This uh, released uh, oocyte here. It will The fimbrae will sort of help to make sure it sort of scoops up and will move into uh, the fallopian tube. Now, the top part here of this uh, fallopian tube is the ampulla, which again, sh that sh should ring a bell. We saw that with the male reproductive system. And this is essentially a, a, a widening of the, of the fallopian tube as it begins to move down into the uterus. Now, there are three main um, walls uh, of, the, uh, of the uterus, the endometrium, myometrium, and perimetrium. Now, these prefixes, should be ringing a bell. Endo, myo, and peri, okay? We remember doing that when we were discussing the heart. Now, although um, although I would expect you to uh, uh, know and at least recognize these three words, um, the main one I will be focusing on and uh, the main one I will really expect you to know about is the endometrium. That's the one that we're going to be focusing on a lot more today. Now, what we are essentially looking at here is a very, very, very zoomed in section of the ovary. And we're going to be essentially looking at the stages of follicular um, development. Um, and, and this plays a very, very large role in the, uh, in the ovarian cycle within females. So what we see over here is sort of five, uh, sorry, five, uh, seven different steps. Now, if we come over here, I've sort of broken them all down for you. Um, starting off at the very beginning are our primary follicles, okay? These are the primary oocytes. These have been... Um that was the wrong button. There we go. Um, these have been, uh, you know, present since, uh, since birth. And what's going to happen is um, one oocyte will be one layer of these follicular cells. Um, then what's going to happen is that these... Uh, primary follicles are they're going to start to develop into these secondary follicles, except we call them now granulosa cells. Now, these will continue to develop, but as, as you can see, they're sort of getting bigger. So uh, it's, it's sort of quite selective. Some of these are going, some of these follicles are going to die off uh, and some of them are going to grow bigger and, and, and larger. So this is going to um, so continue on. So we've got the late secondary follicle. Then it's going to then um, come over to the um, vesicular follicle. Okay, and this is a, a, essentially a, a near um, fully matured uh, uh, follicle. Okay. Now what is then going to happen is that it's beginning to bulge um, on the outermost part of. The, the ovary here. And what is then going to happen is that um, sort of midway through the, the menstrual cycle, okay, the, uh, it's going to essentially rupture. And um, this, the now ruptured and what is called the now ovulated um, oocyte is going to be released from, um, uh, from the ovary. And it is this 
here, this ovulated oocyte that is being scooped up by these fimbrae and moved up the, uh, the uterine tube here. Now, this next stage uh, is, is, is quite interesting. So what's then going to happen is that once we uh, have this ovulated oocyte and this oocyte uh, since leaves uh, the, the ovary, what is going to happen is that this remaining part here of this follicle is going to develop into what is called the corpus luteum. Now, what the corpus luteum does, and again, this entire process, it's not just for the um, development and release of, a, um, of an oocyte. Uh, it, it also has a huge endocrino... Uh, endocrin we'll, we'll, we'll try that one again. Endocrino endocrinological... Bloody hell. <laughs> we got there eventually, guys. It took a few goes. Uh, body chemicals. Let's just say that word. That's a little bit better. <laughs> Uh, it, it plays a huge role in hormones, okay? Uh, it plays, uh, it, it releases a lot of uh, progesterone, but it also uh, releases um, estrogen. Uh, and this plays a, a role in, um, uh, in in the sort of latter phase of the menstrual cycle, um, especially, it, you know, to do with um, if there is uh, successful fertilization. Because when we're looking at the, the menstrual cycle, a lot of it is down to... Um, was there successful fertilization? If yes, you are now pregnant and that these things will happen. If no, then you are not pregnant and these things will happen, which we're going to talk about in a moment. So what will then happen is um, it will then develop into the corpus luteum, which will then produce progesterone and estrogen. Um, however, uh, if there is no fertilization that has occurred, what will happen then is that the uh, corpus luteum will then further degrade into what is called the corpus albicans. And what happens here is that essentially it, it, it kind of uh, shrivels up, I guess, um, and, and will uh, sort of degenerate, will deteriorate um, just before the, the beginning of the menstrual uh, bleeding. Now, again, the corpus albican forms in the absence of of conception. So basically there was no fertilization, there was no conception there. So the corpus luteum will then um, deteriorate into the corpus albicans. So we can see here, here is our, let me zoom in, there we go. We have our corpus luteum here uh, and these, these lovely endocrine cells um, here producing that progesterone and estrogen. Um, and if there is no fertilization, what will happen is that will sort of just degrade, deteriorate into our corpus albicans, um, menstrual bleeding will occur, and then the whole cycle will repeat, um, repeat once more. Okay, now in the same way that we were discussing and looking at um, spermatogenesis, which is um, the, the production of sperm cells. We also have oogenesis, which is the production of oocytes or eggs. Now, again, I am not going to go into um, any great detail of the, the primary, uh, first and second sort of polar bodies and meiosis one and meiosis two or anything like that. Um, as cool as it would be, but we're not doing genetics here, okay? Um, that's sort of getting a little bit sidetracked. The the big thing that we sort of need to just keep in our uh, keep in our minds is that when we are looking at spermatogenesis or oogenesis, is that they have half the amount of chromosomes, okay? They only have one N, not two N. They have twenty three chromosomes instead of forty six, okay? So your normal cells have 46, our sex cells, so sperm and oocyte or ovum have 23. Um, that's all we really need to be aware of there. Okay, so we have the, um, the ovary there. Okay, we've seen that um, uh, development of the um, of those uh, follicles that then progress into the um, ovulated oocyte, uh, and what's going to have then happen is that those fimbrae are going to sort of sweep and scoop up that oocyte and move it into the fallopian tube. 
Now, what's then going to happen is that sperm will typically reach the oocyte within the ampulla. So if I just rewind a little bit, the ampulla is here. So when I was sort of saying that, you know, sperm um, needs to be uh, sort of surrounded or encompassed by that um, seminal fluid to sort of survive the perilous journey, that is because, you know, the... Um, the, the ejaculate will be sort of deposited here. It then has to move all the way up, move uh, through the cervix, up through the, the uterus, through the um, fallopian tubes, down to the ampulla. And it's there that it will then make contact um, with that oocyte for um, what is to be hopeful fertilization. Now, again, I'm not going to go uh, super in depth on the process of fertilization. It is um, a, a little bit intricate. Um, again, this is sort of, we're just sort of touching on the basics, okay? You're probably going to learn a lot more um, about the specifics of sort of fertilization and, and stuff like that uh, further on in your studies. So then what's going to happen is the sperm cell is going to sort of burrow through and... Um, break through the, the sort of outermost wall of the of the oocyte. And once it's reached um, through that outer layer, it will then um, break down the, the sp uh, sperm cells, outer sort of the, the head of that sperm cell, and will then release its genetic material into the egg. And what that will then do is that the egg will then uh, release uh, a series of, um, you know, various hormones and signals there to shut off the egg so that, you know, more than one sperm cell can't deposit the genetic material there. That's obviously not what we want. And then what's going to happen is that the, what is now the fertilized oocyte is now referred to as a zygote. Now, what the zygote is, is essentially that initial fusion of sperm and egg. So sperm and egg have fused together. The genetic material has fused together. Now, what is then going to happen is that um, once we now have the formation of this zygote, it will then continue to move down this fallopian tube down here with the overall goal being to reach um, the uterus because the, the, the primary function of the uterus is for um, the um, development of, of the fetus and, um, you know, to for the fetus to grow essentially into a, into a newborn child. Now, as I've mentioned before, there are three main layers here. We've got the endometrium, the myometrium, and the perimetrium. The main one I'm going to be focusing on here is the endometrium. This is the innermost layer of the uterus. Um, this is also the layer that is essentially shared like this functional, so the outermost layer um, of the endometrium is what is uh, shed um, during menstruation and then is obviously regenerated. And it's obviously um, within the endometrium that the um, uh, blastula, is, which is the more developed form of a zygote, which I'm going to talk about in a moment, um, that is where it will implant into the uterus um, to sort of um, uh, kickstart pregnancy. Now, um, just further down from the uterus is the cervix and the vagina. Now, something again that we need to be very clear on. The vagina is not the external genitalia. They are different. I thought I had an image. Never mind. Uh, where am I? Here. Yes. So the, the vagina refers to essentially the birth canal. It is the um, internal um, canal of the female reproduction system. The external genitalia is called the vulva. Okay. Um, there are um, uh, several parts of the vulva. Okay. You've got the labia majora. Okay. This is the um, more uh, thicker um, part of the external genitalia. And you've got the labia minora. These are sort of the thinner skin folds that help to, um, to protect the, um, the opening of the vagina. Um, you've got the, the clitoris and you've also got, um, the, um, the urethra. Okay. Which is where, um, you know, obviously it connects to the bladder for urination. Okay. 
Okay, so what we're going to do now is have a very quick look into the female reproductive cycle. So what's going to happen here is that it is controlled from the hormones that are secreted from the hypothalamus, the pituitary and the ovary. Now we've already discussed the hypothalamus and the pituitary already, okay? The hypothalamus, we've got our um, gonadotropin releasing hormone. Oh, excuse me. Um, and from the pituitary um, gland, we've got our uh, luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. And essentially these hormones help to control, as well as, you know, estrogen and progesterone and all that help to control the monthly cycle. Um, now these are split into two different parts. We have the ovarian cycle, which is what we've already covered already. This is the development of those, you know, the primary follicles, the secondary follicles leading to the release of that ovulated um, ovum, which will then cause a uh, formation of the corpus luteum and the corpus albicans if there is no um, conception. So that is the ovarian cycle, which again, just to clarify is this that we were discussing down here. What we also have, though, is the uterine cycle. Now, essentially, what is what is happening here is that the ovaries are um, developing and releasing that um, that oocyte, that egg, um, to prepare for fertilization. The uterus is essentially like the um, the the home. Okay, so you're you're preparing for guests. Okay, so you, you've gotten a call saying, "Hey, look, we've we've got um, the egg has been released. It's on the way." So the uterus will begin to prepare for this new sort of house guest, which in this case is going to be a, a, an egg, but we don't know if it's fertilized or not. So what it's going to do is it's going to prepare the uterus by building up and thickening the, um, endo, the endometrial layer to prepare for this, um, uh, this zygote to um, bind to and sort of um, implant itself into. Now, if that does happen, fantastic. That is essentially pregnancy which again, we're gonna talk about in a moment. However, if this implantation does not happen, if there is uh, no zygote, because there has been no fertilization, what will then happen is that these levels, uh, these um, estrogen progesterone levels will drop off and this outermost functional layer of the endometrium will be shed, which is um, the, uh, the bleeding stage of, of menstruation. Now, again, what we're sort of looking at here is just a bit of a summary, a bit of a recap on the hormones, um, especially uh, how they relate to the reproductive cycle. So what kicks off this entire process it was, is that we've got this gonadotropin releasing hormone that is going to um, be secreted by the hypothalamus and it's going to trigger the pituitary gland to secrete follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. Now, what follicle stimulating hormone does is it triggers and initiates the growth of the follicles um, that help then to secrete estrogen. So when we were looking at the primary follicle going to the secondary follicle, et cetera, et cetera, that is kickstarted by this FSH. Now, by having FSH come in here and um, uh, sort of stimulate or initiate the release of these, um, oh, sorry, the development rather of these follicles, that is then going to then uh, cause the increased release of um, estrogen. And that estrogen is then going to trigger within the uterus, the regeneration of that endometrial layer, okay? To, be, uh, to basically begin preparing for what could be a, a possible um, implantation um, next month. Now that was follicle stimulating hormone. What about luteinizing hormone? What that does is it helps to stimulate um, ovulation and it will help to promote the formation of the corpus luteum. Now what the corpus luteum's primary role here is that it will produce a little bit of, um, of estrogen, but its main one here is to um, release progesterone. And what proge uh, progesterone does, one of the major uh, functions of that is to, um, uh, in, in ensure that sort of it, it increases the production, the buildup of that functional layer within the endometrium to prepare for potential implantation of the zygote. Okay, so looking at the menstrual phase. Okay, so when we are looking at um, 
menstruation, okay? It's usually around five days of, um, of actual menstruating and the first day is considered sort of the beginning of the cycle. Now, what we see within the uterus, because again, we've got our uterine cycle and we've got our ovarian cycle. Within the uterus, what we are seeing is a decline in the levels of progesterone. Now, this is essentially because of, um, where am I? Here. So, this um, decrease in progesterone is due to the conversion of our corpus luteum into the corpus albicans because there was no, um, there was not a, a successful um, fertilization or implantation within the uh, the endometrium. So because of that, the corpus luteum degraded into the corpus albicans, which led to a drop in terms of progesterone levels, which means that um, it essentially causes endometrial vasoconstriction. So what that essentially is doing is it's restricting or reducing blood flow to the endometrium, causing that outermost um, layer of tissue there to sort of die and to be shed away. Um, and that's what is sort of being described down at the bottom here. So after that dilation, um, uh, so, uh, yeah, that functional layer is being shed and removed, which is um, this sort of the five days of, of, of bleeding approximately. Now within the ovary, okay, uh, around 10 follicles will begin to develop. Um, so again, the stimulation of that FSH is then triggering um, production of those follicles to essentially, I need to move that image here. Here we go. To begin this stage here, to begin the development of these um, primary follicles to um, develop into the secondary follicles, et cetera, et cetera. Essentially, we're getting, we're getting the, the cycle started again. So once this happens, we move then into the pre-ovulatory um, phase. And what is then happening within the ovary? Um, we are seeing this follicular, uh, follicular development, okay? It's moving from primary uh, follicle to secondary follicle under the stimulation of follicle stimulating hormone. Again, the, the, the hints in the name. And what is then going to happen is that um, one by one, obviously there's not going to be as much space. These, some of these follicles are going to degrade. Uh, it's going to be a little bit of like a survival of the fittest. Um, and during this pre-ovulatory um, phase, it's going to last from day six to day 13. And by day 13 to day 14, what's going to happen is instead of having 10 um, follicles, there's only going to be one. Uh, and this is the graphene follicle. Okay, this is the enlarged follicle that is essentially bulging on the surface of the ovary, um, getting ready to be um, expelled out during ovulation. So that's what's happening here in the ovary. There's a lot happening in this pre-ovulatory phase. Now within the uterus, what we're seeing here is this increase in estrogen levels, which has been caused in thanks to the uh, release of this follicle stimulating hormone. And what that is doing is essentially stimulating the repair and re-thickening that endometrial layer because it was, it was shed before. It was just shed during this menstrual phase. So what we need to do now is essentially regrow and replenish that uh, outermost layer to prepare for potential um, implantation in this next cycle here. Okay, okay, so essentially this is what I was just describing before. Um, I forgot this image was in here, so that would have been nice to have, but that's okay. Um, and what, what this is essentially doing is a really nice flow chart explaining um, what is happening at each stage here when we're looking at sort of the corpus luteum, corpus albicans, everything like that. This would be a really good thing to use as a summary study slide, okay, in which you um, practice uh, and sort of you can blank out what is happening in each of these steps and write that in yourself. That's a good little study tip. Okay, so now we have reached the post ovulatory phase or also sort of known as the secretory phase. Now, this is the most consistent of the phase. So this one lasts for the, the next 14 days. So this is sort of the latter half of, um, of the menstrual cycle. Now, when we're looking at the ovary, what's important here is that the corpus luteum will, um, will be produced. Okay. So once that, um, the, the oocyte has been expelled from the, um, uh, from the ovary and is then being scooped up, uh, and moved into, um, the fallopian tubes. The big thing here is that the body is going to go, okay, 
what did fertilization occur? So let's say if no fertilization occurs, okay? The oocyte is going to move down the fallopian tube, okay? It's going to be propelled by those cilia and it's going to, that oocyte is then going to move into the uterus, but there's no um, implantation is going to occur, okay? Because there's no fertilization. And what that means is, is that um, because there's no impl- um, implantation, the... Um, the, uh, the 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 endometrial layer there um, is is not going to be maintained because the corpus luteum is going to degrade. Okay, the corpus luteum is going to degrade to the corpus albicans, which means that there's going to be no more progesterone being secreted. And because there's no more progesterone being secreted, what's going to then happen is that um, outermost layer of the um, of the uterus, that endometrial layer, that functional layer, is going to be shed. However, if, say, there was successful fertilization and there was a successful implantation within the uterus, what is going to happen there is that once that uter- uh, the, the zygote there has bound to that endometrial layer, it's going to trigger the release of a hormone and it's called HCG, okay? It's called human chorionic gonadotropin. Now, what this hormone does is essentially send a signal to the corpus luteum and basically say, stop, okay? Your services are still required. Do not degrade. Do not break down. And what's going to happen is, in the case that there is successful fertilization, the corpus luteum will not, I repeat, will not form a corpus albicans. This corpus luteum will essentially be reinforced and will um, not degrade and will continue to produce progesterone and a little bit of estrogen and will not cause that shed- like shedding of the outermost layer of the uterus. Now, the corpus luteum will continue to do this essentially until the, the placenta has been formed, approximately sort of two to three months in, and then the placenta will, will take over that role. Um, so again, to come back to what we were looking at over here, the, the body is essentially asking, look, did fertilization occur? Yes or no. If it did occur, what's going to happen is that HCG is going to be released, which is going to stop the breakdown of the corpus luteum. It will stop the breakdown of the corpus luteum into the corpus albicans, which means that progesterone and a little bit of estrogen will continue to be produced, which means that there will be no um, shedding of that outermost layer. If, however, however, no fertilization occurs, the corpus albicans will be formed, there will be a drop in the progesterone levels, and that will then uh, induce that shedding of the um, endometrial layer. Now, again, in the uterus, what is happening here, the corpus luteum hormones uh, are going to promote the formation of more of these endometrial glands and will um, secrete glycogen and vascularization. Uh, Right. So why is it secreting glycogen? What is what is the point of that? Um, When we were talking about GIT, I literally said to you guys, oh, it's, you know, uh, glycogen, which is the, the short term storage form of glucose. It only exists in the liver and skeletal muscle. So what the hell is happening here? Well, what, what we have here is the development of a zygote, okay? It's, impl- it's implanting and we need energy. We need this energy source because we are trying to grow a heap of new... We're growing a baby, basically, and you're trying to grow a heap of new tissue. That needs energy. So, okay, cool. That makes sense. So, so what's the go then with this vascularization? Well, we need energy, definitely. We also need blood. We need blood supply to, you know, to, uh, to this endometrial layer because we need more blood there to deliver nutrients, to deliver energy, and to remove waste during this development stage. Now, again, this happens in the event of successful fertilization and implantation. If there is no fertilization that occurs, the menstrual phase of the menstrual cycle will begin and that outermost layer is being shed.
So this is a, a, a really good little schematic here of what is happening. And this is a really good, like uh, a really good summary of what is happening in both the ovarian cycle and the uterine cycle. So at the very beginning of this cycle, you have the menstruation phase. Okay. That is the shedding and um, release of that outermost layer. And during that stage, we have the development of these um, follicles, the primary follicles, the secondary follicles. Then as we see in this pre-ovulatory phase within the uterus, we're seeing that thickening of the uteral layer. Um, and at that same time, we're seeing the um, further maturation of this graphene follicle. And then during ovulation, which is approximately day 14, we see the rupturing of this follicle and the release of this oocyte here. That will then move down the fallopian tubes and this remaining sort of carcass, I guess you would say, uh, that is then turned into our corpus luteum, which is producing the progesterone predominantly and a little bit of estrogen there. Now, in the event of successful implantation, so if this um, oocyte gets fertilized and implants itself nicely, say in here, then the corpus luteum will continue to exist due to the release of HCG. If, however, there is no successful fertilization and implantation, the corpus luteum is going to then degrade into the corpus albicans. And that sudden decrease in progesterone will cause um, the beginning of menstruation. Now, what the pill does is by decreasing, it will decrease and inhibit gonadotropin releasing hormone. What that does is that it will then decrease FSH and LH from occurring. And what that does is it prevents the LH surge. Now, I haven't discussed the LH surge yet, but the LH surge is a massive spike of luteinizing hormone, which essentially triggers this. It triggers the rupturing of the, of the oocyte. Uh, and by preventing th this LH surge, we are preventing ovulation. So the ovaries are going to sort of think that ovulation has occurred, but it actually hasn't. Now, a big myth I really want to dispel here because far too many people believe this to be true. The pill does not trick your body into thinking you are pregnant. That is absolutely false. Now, it is true that you will not ovulate during pregnancy, but the pill absolutely does not trick your body into thinking it's pregnant. That would be uh, disastrous. <laughs> Um, also too, is that, uh, that is a, a very generic, um, uh, um, mode of action of, of the pill. Uh, there are many different types of pills that will act in many, uh, many different ways. Okay, so what we're looking at here is obviously our ovarian cycle, which I've described. Now, we're also looking at these gonadotropin levels, looking at follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. And what we see here, if we trace this luteinizing hormone, we've got sort of day nine, day 11, day 12, and then boom, huge spike, big, big, big spike in this luteinizing hormone, which is uh, helping to trigger this, this ovulation. Now, looking at these ovarian hormone levels as well, we can see as we get right to the very end um, of that uh, post-ovulatory cycle, we can see that the estrogen and progesterone levels, especially progesterone, are, are absolutely plummeting. What this is telling me is that there was no successful fertilization, okay? If, however, these levels kind of tapered off like this, if they kind of kept going out, I would say that there would be uh, a successful fertilization. Now, uh, for the interest of avoiding, obviously, copyright, I'm not going to um, play this video just now. We will watch this video um, during the shoot workshop tomorrow. Uh, but yeah, this this YouTube clip is a, is a fantastic um, visual representation of what's happening in these graphs with a really good explanation. Um, it's also linked on the Moodle page if you guys want to check that out before tomorrow's class. All right, guys. So, how are we how are we feeling? How are we going with everything? Um, we've obviously covered quite a lot of content. Um, do we need a quick five minute breather? Do we need a quick five minute break, or are we are we all good to um, to continue on?
All G, feeling good. Feeling good, feeling gravy. Awesome, let's soldier on. I love it. So what we've discussed um, in sort of quite a lot of detail now is the female reproductive system, a lot of those key female structures. And we've also looked at the ovarian and the uterine cycle during um, the uh, female menstrual cycle. Now, obviously all of this is, is leading to a main purpose, a main, uh, a main objective, and that is pregnancy and human development why the purpose of reproduction okay uh the human race is not going to exist for very long unless we uh we we have this process in place <laughs> oh, good stuff guys good stuff um now some some terminology here we have the gestation period okay this is the time span uh that occurs between fertilization to birth approximately 38 weeks uh, plus minus um now you've got this prenatal uh period with uh you know embry um uh, words are hard embryological development and fetal development okay um yeah th these are just sort of some basic definition words here now, this is what I was referring to before um, when we were looking at um, a zygote versus a, a, um, a the, the blastula or a blastula cyst. So the zygote here is the initial fertilization of the, the egg. So if I sort of zoom in, we can see we've got the sperm, we've got the egg, that sperm cell meets the egg, those genetic material combine, which is what we see over here. And that is a zygote. It is a fertilized egg, but it is still one cell. What is then going to happen is in the period of approximately six-ish days, um, this fertilized zygote is going to move down this fallopian tube. Now, during this time, this zygote is going to undergo cellular rep, uh, replication. It's going to divide, okay? So it's going to go from one to four cells. Uh, and essentially, it's going to um, form what is called a um, blastula cyst or a blastula here. Now, what is then going to happen is as it begins to move down, into the uterus, it's going to want to implant itself onto this uteral lining here. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that, don't even worry. Ah, I will talk about twins though in a moment. Now, it, it's during this uh, implantation that we see here, that's then we, uh, we see that release of HCG, that's gonna keep that corpus luteum nice and alive. Um, it's going to continue the release of um, progesterone and, and a little bit of estrogen, which is gonna stop this degradation of the um, endometrium, okay? We don't want that to just be shed and to leave. Um, and we'll then facilitate um, what is to be the very, very beginnings of pregnancy. Now, let us look at twins. Again, I'm gonna be quite brief with this. Um, there are two main types of twins. The first one here is called a fraternal twin. These are dizygotic. So di meaning two and zygote, okay? So zygote is what we were looking at over here. This is a zygote. So when we're looking at fraternal twins, what is happening is during this ovulation, during the release of this ovum here, what can sometimes happen is instead of one ovum being released, two will be released. Now, these are two different eggs that have been released at the same time and are fertilized by two different 